In this video, I'm going to examine whether or not there are patriarchal patterns to be found in the way that men and women are distributed within political structures. In the last video, I used descriptive statistics to use data to represent what the world looks like. That was it. It's not very controversial, just describing the data. And in this video, I'm also going to use descriptive statistics to demonstrate a pattern, again, where women are excluded disproportionately in comparison with men to positions of political power. Now, before I start to kind of clear things up, because there seems to be some confusion as to what descriptive statistics are and how they can be used and what they can't be used for and how we should use them appropriately, let me say that the social sciences have three main tasks. One is descriptive analysis. That is to actually look around the world and observe it, collect the data, and then describe the patterns that we see in the data. The social sciences also use inferential statistics, survey data. Um, we use experimental data, controlling for a difference of means test or looking for statistically significant coefficients. We also have normative analysis, and that is evaluating the extent to which we could do things better or that we could do better things normatively in both sense of the word. In this video, I want to use descriptive statistics, and I'm going to put up a description of what those are and how they're used from a statistical website source. Descriptive statistics are a way to analyze data that help describe, show, or summarize it in a meaningful way such that patterns might emerge from the data. Descriptive statistics, therefore, enable us to present the data in a more meaningful way, which allows a simpler interpretation of the data. In that description, the important thing I want to pull out is patterns emerging from the data. And that's what the last video did. It looked at the patterns in the data, and that's what this video is going to do as well. It's going to look for patterns of behavior in the data again and again and triangulate them to draw a conclusion based on reality. If we map out the ways that political power or other forms of power can be distributed on the basis of sex. We have two extreme types and then a median point. So on the two extremes are 100% men occupying positions of power and influence. The other side is 100% women occupying positions of power and influence. And in the middle, you would have an equal distribution between the sexes of around 50-50 you know, if we're talking about the you know, absolute median point. If we're going to look for the effects of patriarchy in the data, we need something to compare it against. And it doesn't really make sense. There's not enough, you know, we could look for matriarchy, but I think I would be criticized by people for putting up a false dichotomy. So I think it's more theoretically robust to evaluate patriarchy up against an equal distribution of positions between men and women. In that way, you can see the extent to which things are egalitarian or patriarchal, depending on how they move on that spectrum. And so I'm going to be maintaining that similar process of assuming a, an equal distribution of power and influence is sort of the natural, the, the null hypothesis, the baseline, and then predicting that the impact of patriarchy is going to be to give men additional power and influence relative to women. And if we see that men are enjoying access to more power and influence, we can reject the null hypothesis that this particular thing that we're looking at is egalitarian. And if we reject the null hypothesis, we must accept the alternative hypothesis, which is that patriarchy is disproportionately advantaging men in that particular power relations. I was criticized in the last video for not, well, the claims were that I didn't prove my hypothesis because um, I, I left bits out, and I'm going to explain why I didn't. But to make things clearer, I will be explicitly linking now the predictions and the results and putting them together at the end of the video so that there's no misunderstanding as to what I've demonstrated. So based on the comments that I received, I've decided to create a three-point measure of patriarchy, breaking apart its components, and then we can test each component individually. And that way, if a structure is found to have all three elements, it is fully patriarchal in terms of the definition. If it's two out of three uh, meets its criteria, then it is mostly patriarchal in its structure. And if it only meets one out of the three, then it is partially patriarchal. But it's still patriarchal. It just doesn't have the complete range of patriarchal behaviors compared to other patriarchal structures. So those three points that I'll be linking again by the end of the video are patriarchy is in effect if power and influence 
are held by men disproportionately to women, that that power is maintained through cultural norms and customs that favor men, and that women are being withheld from having opportunities. I've also indicated here the data I think are valid depending on which step we're going to be looking at. So when it looks to holding positions of power, obviously descriptive statistics will probably be enough. Cultural norms and customs, however, aren't easily quantifiable. That's something that people do through their experience. So there might be descriptive data for that, but there might also be qualitative data that people describe their experiences with cultural practices, you know, like how Congress runs in certain ways. There's also the ability to look at withholding opportunity from women, both descriptively and qualitatively. So that's just a, a little outline of the kinds of data I will be using when presenting this information. To apply this three-point test to my last video, we can see that we could conclude, based on the data, that patriarchal power is held by men in Congress, the U.S. House and Senate, in that 80% of the elected pos positions are occupied by men that there are cultural norms and customs that favor men, there's a seniority system that benefits men, and also there was a willing ignoring of women's basic needs in terms of access to a bathroom for nearly a century in the house. That is certainly a practice to make women feel like outsiders. And finally, in terms of withholding opportunity for women, women talk about their experience of sexism and sexual harassment, and this is an attempt by their male colleagues to silence them or dismiss them, thereby making it more difficult for them to rise in the leadership because the men around them aren't taking them seriously. In this video, to expand on the way that women are relatively deprived in terms of political power and influence to men, I'm going to focus on three areas. Voting, we've done the elected ones that I've just reviewed, lobbyists and donors. These are the real sources of political power in America. And again, I'm focusing on the US, so my apologies to my international audience, but it makes sense again to do it because it's, I'm American, much of the debate happens in America, and I've also taught on courses about the American presidency and American political system, so I know this stuff easier. It's easier for me to put together a video much quicker. In the last video, people asked, if women vote at a higher rate than men, does that mean we don't have patriarchy? And the answer is no, and don't, you don't have to believe me when I say that because I'm going to show you. The basic premise of that idea is that women turn out at a higher rate, therefore they have more political influence. What this fails to take into account is the structural impact of gerrymandering on House seats. And there's also a study that demonstrates that voting has no effect on the policies that are passed, which means that both men and women's votes really don't impact policy at all. But let's go through the numbers one by one. Examining turnout, it is the case descriptively that women turn out at a slightly higher rate than men. You can see the last two numbers there for 2012 were women's turnout being just under 64% and men's turnout being just under 60%. But does this translate into political power? And the answer, as I pointed out, is no. One aspect as to why women do not achieve additional political power from this very minor increase in turnout is the effect of gerrymandering. So let's look at that. This was written in 2014, and in that election, as many as 369 seats were entirely safe, and another were almost safe, which left only 40 seats out of 435 that were up for grabs. And Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia has a blog called Crystal Ball. He classified only nine congressional seats as toss-up. It doesn't matter if you turn out at a higher rate if you don't have a choice in terms of your candidates. And if there are no open seats that people are competing in, then women don't have any political power over the candidate to say, we got you elected, because the whole system was rigged from the start. Another reason why women do not derive political power from their slightly increased voter turnout is that voting doesn't matter to public policy. A study in 2014 found that ordinary Americans have virtually no impact whatsoever on the making of public policy. Instead, it found that rich individuals and business-controlled interests largely shaped political outcomes. For those of you who know statistics, this is the next interesting and depressing number. Using inferential statistics, which control for the impact of other factors 
in terms of the overall explanation, they found that controlling for the power of economic elites and organized interest groups, ordinary American influence registers at non-significant near zero levels. Instead, it's rich individuals and business dominated interest groups that dominate the policy making process and in particular business based interest groups. In terms of voting, men and women are equally ineffectual. Women do not get any benefit from turning out at a slightly higher rate when it comes to impacting public policy. And the links for this study will be, of course, in the description box below. If voting doesn't matter, what about the people who are working on behalf of special interests, right? Because that's where the real power is being wielded. Well, let's take a look. This is a really interesting bit of research that I found, and it examines the gender gap in lobbying in the Washington lobbying court. And what is interesting to notice first is that there are far more men registered as lobbyists in 2012. But they also provide an assessment of how much the contracts were worth based on the sex of the lobbyist. And looking at these numbers, you can see that the most effective hire you can have as a lobbying firm in DC is a woman on her own. Because a woman on her own will bring in, on average, a contract worth over $33,000. That compares with one man who brings in, on average, about $26,000 in contracts, two women, and one man and a woman are both more profitable than two men working together. Given the free market and the way that the market works, you would think that women would dominate the lobbying industry because they are simply better at their jobs. They bring in more money for their companies. They generate more revenue. And yet, we aren't seeing a trend of women's hiring being increased in this industry. 2012 was not a one-off year where women just happened to be doing better. In fact, the average contract between a client and a single female lobbyist was worth more than a similar contract between a client and a single male lobbyist in 2002, 2007, and 2012. Women have been more profitable employees in the lobbying industry for over a decade. Yet despite that natural market force for women to be hired in order to be more profitable, in 2002, 32% of the lobbyists were women. Ten years later, it had only increased by 3%. In all this time, women have been more profitable employees. So what explains the fact that their proportion of lobbyists is not rising to reflect their merit? Just to give you those numbers again, so that you can examine the percentage of men and women as registered lobbyists and the average value of lobbying contracts by gender and number of lobbyists. Because women are not being hired as employees on the bottom level and working their way up, we're also seeing the fact that women are not achieving parity inside the CEO structure because there's a smaller pool of women to draw from. And the consequence of that is twofold. One, women are very underrepresented in terms of CEOs of lobbying firms. And two, there is an astonishing sexist gender gap against women in this industry. Among lobbying CEOs, only eight of 50 were women. And the ratio of women CEOs at K Street's top firms is over 15%, which at the time of writing was lower than the share of women in Congress. You can see the way that not hiring women based on their merit then makes it harder for women to advance to positions of CEO because there's less of them and they are considered to be worth less money, as we can see from this next slide. Women CEOs of the top 50 most politically active trade lobbying groups earned on average 68 cents to the dollar from their male counterparts. Bloomberg found a whopping $600,000 gender gap existed between men and women's salaries, with the female CEO making on average 1.3 million compared to men making 1.93. What conclusions can we draw from this data? Well, despite bringing in more revenue, women lobbyists are only 35% of all lobbyists. Women who are CEOs of lobbying firms are underpaid due to a sexist industry wage gap. And three, men hold more political power as lobbyists than do women, and men benefit from a sexist wage gap relative to women. Finally, we're gonna look at 
where the real political power in America comes from. Donors. The basic premise here, and it's taken from the article that was done in the study I cited above, rich individuals and business control interest groups largely shape political outcomes. Therefore, if we have fewer women donating to campaigns, we'll see lower political influence by women. This article called The Gender Gap in Political Giving literally like just came out in the last two weeks. And as you can see, about 30% of big donors to political campaigns are women. That means for every dollar that flows from big donors into the campaign coffers, 76 from it has come from a man and 24 cents from a woman. Now, what are some of the factors that might influence this? The article noticed an interesting pattern. The wage and wealth gap between men and women's pay plays a role. In states where the average woman earns close to the average man's pay, more of a politician's big donors are women. While that does not explain the whole fundraising gap, it shows a correlation between uh, the wage gap and women's political participation. If women are, like those CEOs, have less money coming into their pockets relative to men, they then have less money in their pockets relative to men to donate to candidates. So it's a structure of economics coming together with politics that are, the economics are holding women back financially, and that means that they have reduced political power when it comes to competing with men uh, for that political influence that comes from financial contributions. Let's take all three pieces of information, put them together, a, a summary, and then compare them to the predictions as to what the world should look like if patriarchy is in effect from the first part of the video. The first conclusion is women's political power through voting is as ineffectual as men. So that's a wash in terms of political power. Men hold and exercise a disproportionate amount of political power in Congress and the Senate when compared to women. Despite bringing in more revenues than their male counterparts, women make up only 35% of all lobbyists in DC. And finally, men have more political influence due to campaign contributions than women, which might be related to the wage gap, in part. In terms of our three-part test for patriarchy, are the data best explained by the patriarchal model of power or the egalitarian one. The patriarchal theory predicts men will hold disproportionate amounts of power and influence. And we see that disproportionate numbers of men are lobbyists and donors compared to women. And for the reasons that we cited. Patriarchy theory predicts cultural norms and customs that favor men. We can see that although men are less profitable employees, they still make up 65% of lobbyists, which means it can't be women's performances as employees that explains their small proportion of the total population of lobbyists. Patriarchy theory predicts that there will be opportunities for women with health. If we look at it structurally in terms of the lobbying uh, power structure, if you don't hire women relative to their performances and based on meritocracy, well then you're not bringing in good candidates to compete for those higher status jobs. So the sexist hiring practices are themselves a barrier to women's opportunities to get to those top CEO positions. And when they do get there, they're paid less than their male counterparts. In conclusion, men as a group have clearly more political power than women do due to their historic and ongoing access to positions of power and wealth. All of the sources for the information in this video will be provided in the description box below. I won't make comments on the other video, I'll do something else about that later, I just want to keep this one focused on the data. But if you're new to my channel, thank you so much for showing up and I look forward to our interactions. Until the next time, I've been Christy, you've been awesome. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. We'll see each other soon.